Hey, good morning, everybody. We're so glad you've joined us for worship. We've got friends uh, not only in our church family, but all over the country and around the world who are tuning in right now. We are so glad that you're with us. I want to tell you that um, we've been helping people during this time, and if you need help, that's why we're here. So let me tell you how you can access some help. One is you can talk to an elder, you can talk to a minister, you can talk with your life group leader or somebody in your life group, or you can go to this website, which you're on, and there's a, a place that says help. And if you'll click on that, you can let us know how we can be helpful to you. Uh, I am so proud of this church. So many of you that I'm talking to right now have done such a wonderful job loving each other, loving your community, and we don't want to stop because needs don't stop, and we just want you to let us know how we can be helpful. All right, I'd like to read our theme verse for the month, and uh, the month is now coming to an end, so let's read it one more time, and that's Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, and these are the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isn't that good? I hope as we begin this assembly that you will lean into the promises that Jesus is making there, and just lean into his goodness as we worship him, and we worship the Father and the Spirit today. It's going to be a wonderful worship time. All right, so it's time for Hug and Howdy, and, and I'm, I'm really loving this time. So I want to encourage you, hug somebody next to you. Don't, don't just give them a hug. Tell them you love them, you appreciate them. And then also take a moment, and this is something we've been doing the last few weeks, and I've enjoyed this. I hope you have as well. Text somebody, send somebody an emoji, let them know that you're thinking about them, that you love them, that you appreciate them. It's that virtual hug. All right, so would you do that? Let's take a few moments and do that right now. Saturn family, uh, this is Kevin Dennis, one of uh, your shepherds. I come to you this morning to read a letter from Scott Marshall, uh, your brother and a, a fellow shepherd, uh, that he wanted read uh, to the Saturn Road family. Saturn Road Church, for the past year, my heart has been burdened with the ongoing thought of stepping down from the eldership. After a long time praying and discussing with my family at home, I have decided that the best thing for me is to step down as one of your elders. I don't have any specific reasons to give other than I believe it is time for me to step down from this role. Our family loves this church and will continue to do our best to help lead and move us forward as a congregation. Thank you all for loving us. We look forward to seeing everyone soon. Sincerely, Scott Marshall. I will personally miss Scott a great deal um, in our uh, meetings and discussions. Uh, he does have a huge heart for this family and will continue to. I am thankful that Scott is following uh, the calling that's been placed in his heart, even if it's to step down. Our brother Gary Edmonds uh, wrote this uh, as a response to Scott's letter. First, he starts with Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Scott Marshall is a devoted disciple of God, one who loves the Lord, his word, and his church. Scott is passionate about everything he does, 
and we all have benefited from his energy and drive to help us in leading the church family. He has led our efforts in so many ministries, especially the young families. He loves the family here at Saturn Road and will continue to be active and serve in various roles. As Solomon describes the seasons we have all experienced on our journey with God, we want to thank Scott for a special season spent serving. We also want to thank Joanna for her giving heart and support during his time as a shepherd. We thank Scott for challenging us to be better, to give our first fruits to God. We will honor his request to step aside, but our prayer is that we will continue to challenge ourselves to carry on with the same passion that Scott has to always strive to be better in our service to God. We would like to finish with a prayer for Scott, Joanna, Bailey, and Abby. This is from Philemon 1, 4 through 7. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Amen. Our God is a consuming fire, burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the holy righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom. And we will keep our is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign. Our God is jealous for his own, none could comprehend. His love and His mercy Our God is exalted on His throne High above the heavens Forever He is worthy And we will keep our eyes on You We will keep our eyes on You This is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable. Saturn Road family. Uh, just as I miss my parents living in Longview and our daughter and son-in-law that live in Austin during this period of oscillation, I miss my Saturn Road family. I like to think of myself as pretty upbeat and positive, uh, but I'm finding that there are times when working remotely and the stresses of isolation can really be a great weight. We as shepherds and ministers um, 
as we begin to look at the and take these unchartered first steps into what Saturn Road family looks like during a pandemic, uh, quite frankly, we're getting lots of advice, requests, and cautions. Um, but I was reminded while reading Galatians chapter 5 where my compass for action really needs to come from. And I'm going to read a few selected verses out of that. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Skipping to verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. My hope is that each of you that are, are staying in tune with God's Spirit and loving one another with the fruit that he's producing in your lives. Let's pray. God, um, I want to thank you for your guiding spirit. I want to thank you for Paul's reminder of where our compass really comes from, and that's from you. I pray that you will truly give us your peace, that we will feel that, we, that we will let that guide the actions and the love that we share with those that are around us, even when they have different feelings about what should be going on in our lives. We we'll pray this in your son's name. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My Savior, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My soul magnifies the Lord. My new church family, I'm Ryan Maloney, your new children's minister, and it's my joy to experience communion with you this morning. I'll be reading from John 6 in the NIRV, the New International Reader's Version of the Bible. It's a children's version of the Bible. Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It's also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd of people followed him. They had seen miraculous signs he had done with those who were sick, and then Jesus went up on a mountainside. There he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, so he said to Philip, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to put Philip to the test. He already knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, eight months' pay would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. 
Another of his disciples spoke up. It was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He said, here's a boy with five small loaves of barley bread. He also has two small fish. But how far will that go in such a large crowd? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of green grass in the place, and they sat down, and the number of men among them was about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks. He handed out the bread to those who were seated, and he gave them as much as they wanted. And then he did the same with the fish. When all of them had enough to eat, Jesus spoke to his disciples. Gather the leftover pieces, he said. Don't waste anything. So they gathered what was left over from the barley loaves, and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces left by those who had eaten. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Your son broke bread, and out of that he filled hungry bellies. That's a miracle that's difficult to imagine. And then later your son broke bread at Passover, and he revealed that his own body was about to be broken to fill hungry souls. As we take this bread, may we remember and experience the miracle of his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's pray for the cup. Father in heaven, your son broke fish, and out of that created fishers of people. That's another miracle that's difficult to imagine. But more than that, your son's broken body fills our hearts full and overflowing. Thank you for sending Jesus to break into this world and to break into our hearts. May Jesus make miracles today by multiplying himself through us. As we drink this cup, may we remember and experience the miracle of your son's death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you for sharing communion with me this morning. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say
Christian songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. If you don't have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and get it and open up to Mark chapter 8. Um, listen, I can't wait till you have an opportunity to, to meet Ryan in person. He is uh, just a wonderful minister and uh, just in his short time is already making a big impact in our church family. And if you have children in our, our church program, they are going to be so blessed um, by Ryan being on our team. And also, I want to thank uh, Matt for just delivering a marvelous message last week from God's Word. I love how Matt dives into the Word, and uh, he is such a blessing to our church family. So thank you, Matt, for uh, the message that you brought last Sunday. So uh, I'm going to do it again. I, I hate to, but um, I'm going to detour off of this study of parables uh, because I came across something in Mark that I wanted to share with you. Uh, we're doing a daily devotional out of the book of Mark, and um, I found something, and it captivated me, and I wanted to talk a little bit more with you, my church family, and friends um, about what I discovered. Now, let me say this. Mark is really trying to answer his gospel, the question, who is Jesus? And I started thinking about it. Uh, have you been to the optometrist lately? Well, probably not in the last few months. But um, if you remember, there's a chart. And you should be looking at it right now. There's a chart, and that optometrist is asking you, uh, read this line. All right, drop down. Read, read another line. Can, can you read this line? And I think in some ways, that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples in the Gospel of Mark. He's asking them constantly, what do you see? Are you getting it? Are you understanding what I'm trying to do, why I've come to earth? And, and so what I'd like to do in the next few moments is take you on a little journey in the eighth chapter of Mark. Now, we're going to look at several passages, so I'm going to ask you to read along with me, and I'm going to ask you to try to remember these little sections that we read, and then we're going to come to uh, one that we'll camp on for just a few moments. So if you have your Bible open, uh, let's look beginning at verse 14. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 14, and we'll read through verse 21. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful. Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces 
did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Now think about that for just a moment. Um, if you've been in our Mark devotional study, you know that earlier Jesus fed 5,000, and they had plenty of leftovers. And then on the heels of what we're reading right now, Jesus fed 4,000, and they had plenty of leftovers. But the disciples get in the boat, and for whatever reason, they only bring one loaf with them. And they're worried, they're worried that they don't have enough to eat. There's just not enough food. And Jesus is saying to them, Hey, guys, are you not seeing? Are you not hearing? I fed 5,000, and we had plenty of leftovers. I fed 4,000, lots and lots left over. And now you're worried about what you're going to eat? Don't you know who I am? Don't you see? Now, jump down to verse 27. This is a little while later. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, this is really interesting. Here, Jesus asked these disciples, what's the word about me? And you get this answer and that answer, lots of speculation about who Jesus is. But Peter then says, but I want to tell you, I know who you are. You are the Messiah. And he couldn't be more right. He got it. He saw clearly. It was a high point for Peter and the rest of the disciples. All right, remember that. One more reading. Beginning at verse 31, and we'll read out through the end of the chapter. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, do you see what happens after this great high point? I know, Peter says, that you are the Messiah. Then Jesus says, well, guys, I need to tell you more. I've come, and I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer at the hands of the leaders, and ultimately, I'm going to be crucified. I'll rise again on the third day, but they're going to kill me. And Mark says that Peter takes Jesus aside, and if it weren't sad, it, it, it would be almost laughable 
he says to the one he's just proclaimed to be the Messiah, I need to talk to you. And then basically he says, it's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen to you. And then Mark says, Jesus turns around on Peter and says, listen, man, what you're doing right now, rebuking me, telling me it's not going to happen, you are an instrument of Satan right now, and you're going to have to get behind me. I, I cannot have this right now. In other words, Peter, you don't get it. You're not seeing clearly. And then he goes on and talks to those disciples and the crowds about what it means, what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. All right, so three readings. And you may be saying, but you skipped a section. I know. And that's the one I want to camp on for a few moments. Verses 22 through 26. I want to read that with you right now. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. All right. Now I got to tell you, if you're like me, that last reading, that story of the blind man, it's a little strange. Did you know it only appears in the Gospel of Mark? And it's interesting where it's placed. It's sandwiched between what we read earlier. The guy's not understanding about food and worried about only having one loaf. And then Peter exclaiming, you know, other people are not getting it, but I see you clearly, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And then Peter, once he hears that Jesus is going to die, pulling Jesus aside and rebuking him, kind of the ups and downs, but in the middle of all of this, is this really strange story about Jesus healing a blind man. And there's a lot unique in this parable. Uh, it seems like it's a partial healing. It, it takes two touches. But it's a healing by Jesus. Now I want to tell you, what I'm so excited about is it has dawned on me that really what Jesus is doing with this healing is he's using it as a parable for his disciples. He's trying to teach them a lesson that has to do with seeing things clearly. It's a parable. And so the question then for you and me is, so what does this story tell us? Jesus is teaching those disciples, look, you don't always see clearly the first time. Well, think about what we read. The guys have witnessed Jesus feeding 5,000, then 4,000, tons of leftovers, and yet when they get in a boat and they've only got one loaf, they're worried about it. They're not seeing clearly who Jesus is. They don't understand. Feeding them is no problem. They are with the Son of God but they don't see it clearly. They saw the miracles, but it didn't register with them. And, and then Peter has that moment of clarity. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. I see it clearly. But then he turns around, and his vision gets cloudy because he wants to rebuke Jesus because Jesus is on mission to redeem the world. And that means he's going to die and be raised back to life. He's teaching them that you don't always see clearly with the first touch. And that's the message for you and me. Let me 
just take a moment and share some things out of that story of the healing of the blind man that speak to my heart. This won't be exhaustive, but hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. One is, did you notice that the blind man had friends who brought him to Jesus? Now that's not unique in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 2, we read about that paralyzed man who had four friends who brought him to Jesus. You remember they dug a hole in the roof and lowered him in front of Jesus so that Jesus could heal him. And here, this blind man, he's got friends who initiate and say, look, let us take you to Jesus. He's doing wonderful things. He can give you sight. We believe that. So we want to get you in front of him. And the point that struck me is that spiritual sight comes in community. Friendships are incredibly important in our spiritual development. And that is true in my life, and I know it's got to be true in your life. We see Jesus more clearly with the help of each other. This past Thursday night, our life group ventured out and we met in a park and we, we spent some time together. And I got to tell you, it was a blessing as we closed, uh, just various members in our group shared scripture that had really been speaking to them recently. And they, they read the scripture and then they talked about what it meant to them. And I was so blessed. I saw more clearly as a result of my time with my brothers and sisters in the kingdom, sharing Jesus with me. And we actually, we talked about the racial tension that is going on right now. And we talked about it from the standpoint of being believers in Jesus. What does that look like for us to respond to what's going on in our country right now? And we talked about scripture and and we spoke really honestly into each other's lives for just a few moments. And you know what? When I left, I saw a little more clearly because that's what community is to do. We're to speak the word of God into each other's lives. We're to share what God is giving us and what he's doing in our lives with each other. And so I'm touched that his friends brought him to Jesus. You remember when Jesus asked him, when he spit in his eyes and then he touched his eyes. And by the way, look at your text. It says Jesus was with the man and, and when he was going to begin to heal him, he literally spit in his eyes. And then he says, what do you see? What do you see? And the man says, well, I can see something, but, but it looks like men, but, but, but they look like trees, and, and the trees are walking around, and, and that's really weird. But I'm struck by the fact that the man was honest in his response to Jesus. What do you see? Well, I see something, but I know it, it can't be right. And by the way, the fact that he knew what trees looked like seemed to indicate that he wasn't born blind. But he's got men that look like trees, and they're walking around, and he knows that's not right, and he's honest, and he tells Jesus, Look, it's not complete. It's not right. I love what um, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote years ago. He's talking about this story, and he says, Above everything else, avoid making premature claims that your blindness is cured. What saved this man was his absolute honesty. You see, I wonder, it's challenging to me. I wonder if sometimes we're not completely honest with Jesus. Because I do think he's always asking us, what do you see? 
What do you see? And you know, think about it. If you had been this man and you were blind, you could have said, well, hey, I see something, and that's better than how I happened to be before I came in contact with you, Jesus. He could have said, you know, I'm, I'm okay. But, but he didn't say that because he knew what he was seeing wasn't clear. It wasn't right. And here's the deal. I wonder. I mean, I ask myself this, and so I'm going to ask you. Do you think as Christ followers we ever just settle? We just accept the way things are. When Jesus says, what do you see? Do you think we ever just say, well, you know, it's all good, when it's not all good? We see men, but they look like trees walking. But we tell him, it's okay, I'll just settle. I'll settle for where I am spiritually right now. I'm reminded of this classic quote by C.S. Lewis, and I want you to look at it with me. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desire not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. I wonder if that's us. And I love that this man, when Jesus spits in his eyes and touches his eyes and, and says, what do you see? I love that he was honest. And remember, this is a parable. It's not that Jesus could not have totally, completely restored his sight with one touch or even with one word. He's doing this because those disciples are around him. They're watching. They're observing what's going on. And he's teaching them a lesson. And the lesson is, it's not always all clear with the first touch. Another thing that I, I take away is sometimes uh, we get poor vision. Things are not clear to us. Because the eye, and I don't mean the eyeball, I mean the eye in self becomes bigger than it should be. I was reading something about nearsightedness, and you should see a chart right now. Nearsightedness occurs when the eye is bigger than average. This causes the light to fall in front of the retina rather than on the retina itself. This means that the image is not centered in the eye as it should be. The result is that the person can see up close but struggles to see far off. And I wonder, I wonder if that describes some of us, at least some of the time on our spiritual journey. I mean, I think that's what happened to those disciples when they got in the boat and all of a sudden they're worried about, man, are we going to have enough to eat? Well, they had forgotten. They, they, they had lost sight of what Jesus had just done in their presence. And, and that's what happened to Peter when Jesus starts talking about dying. This is what the Messiah really is all about, not your preconceived ideas. And so Peter gets bigger than he should be. And he loses humility. And he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Sometimes we get in the way. I know I do. When I become bigger than I should be. And what happens is that I cannot see clearly the work of Jesus in my life. 
you know, it occurs to me, and I think Jesus is teaching this to the disciples. Spiritual growth, spiritual development comes in stages. It's not just one touch. It's a second touch, like this blind man. And sometimes it's a third, a fourth, and it just goes on. And he's constantly clearing our vision. And he's always asking, what do you see? You know that section at the end of the reading, 34 through 38, where Jesus brings the crowd in with the disciples and he says, here's what it means to follow me. I just want to frame that up real quickly with you. He says, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. And then he says, you got to lose your life. And he says, if you lose your life, you'll actually find it. Deny myself, take up my cross, follow Jesus, lose my life. I think that has everything to do with seeing Jesus clearly. Here's what I mean. I can stand before you right now without shame and tell you that denying myself and taking up my cross and following Jesus and losing my life today doesn't mean what it meant to me 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago or even six months ago. Why? Because I didn't see clearly I was striving, and Jesus all along the journey was saying, what do you see? And I would respond, and then he would clear it up a little bit more. And I fully expect that in the next few weeks and months and years, if God lets me live, that I'll see it even differently, more clearly, because I'm having another touch by Jesus. What does it mean? to follow him, to take up the cross. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament, and this may be weird to you, but I just love it. It's Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. Paul writes, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I think that's what Jesus was teaching the disciples in this healing parable. He was saying to them and saying to you and me, hey folks, this is a journey and you're not always going to see clearly and I'm going to keep asking you and you stay with me and I'll clear your vision little by little as you humble yourself and you just follow me. Alexander McLaren said the following, Christian progress does not consist in seeing new things, but in seeing the old things more clearly. The same Christ, the same cross, only more distinctly and deeply apprehended and more closely incorporated into my very being. Listen, we do discover new things as we journey in Scripture together. But I think McLaren is on to something, and that is the majority of the work in our spiritual development, listen to me, the majority of that work is going back to those old things, to Christ, the cross. And wouldn't you agree with me? Walking with him and him constantly saying, Jeff, what do you see? And he says the same thing to you, that he's become more dear with the passage of time because you're seeing him more clearly. And the cross is more powerful because you're seeing it more clearly. I know we love that old hymn, Amazing Grace. And that line, I once was blind, but now I see.
It's true. When we initially come to Christ, Scripture says that He's called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We're blind, but we see because we're saved. But you know what? I think this healing parable by Jesus teaches us, but that's not the end of his work on our sight. He refines it constantly over time. So maybe what Mark was telling those disciples and those of us to follow who love Scripture and love Jesus, maybe what he's telling us is, you're the real deal. But that doesn't mean you always see clearly. And walk with Jesus. That's what he did with those disciples. I marvel at the patience of Jesus and the love that he poured into those 12 men. And then he pours into your life and my life. And he just says, let's keep walking together. You're the real deal. Let me touch your life again. What do you see? And let me touch you again. What do you see? And things become clearer and clearer. Man, that excites me. I think that's what discipleship is all about. And so would you join me in committing to praying for one another? I need you to pray for me that I will stay humble and I will be honest with the Lord and I will allow those second and third and fourth touches by Jesus in my life. And I want to pray that for you. Let's pray that for each other and let's be a community that God can use to help clear our eyesight, our spiritual sight as we pour into one another. Could we do that together? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the gospel of Mark, the story of Jesus. And I thank you for chapter 8 and this beautiful healing parable. I thank you for the realness of the disciples and the love and patience and grace of Jesus in their lives. And to know that is for us as well is so wonderful. I pray for my brothers and sisters that we will stay humble and honest before Jesus. And when he asks, what do you see? And we'll tell him truthfully. Because there are times when we're confused and when we're sad and when we're angry and times when we truly don't understand times when we lose our faith like those disciples and times when we just do the wrong thing like Peter did. And then there are those moments of clarity. Just like Peter, when we get it. So I pray that you'll bless all of us on this journey. And it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power.
to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our Hey, church family and friends that are watching, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I want to take a quick moment and just say a word about what's happening in our country right now. We've got this pandemic, but we also have uh, the racial tensions, and uh, we're witnessing uh, what's going on right now in many, many cities. And I know it's disconcerting, and, and what we watched uh, in Minnesota, uh, what happened uh, was very disconcerting as well. And so I, I just want to say a word to you, and that is we need to be the church. We need to be really serious about our role in being people of peace and reconciliation. We need to love people well. And I would encourage you, along with me right now, to really monitor and think through and pray through what we say and what we do. I mean, really take a very, very um, close look at all of those things. I uh, was reading a passage this morning I want to share with you. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. I don't know what your thoughts have been, but mine have been, there's only one answer to bring people together, black and white, whatever the color is. Ultimately, there's only one answer, and that is Jesus Christ. But we need to understand that Jesus moves through his people. He moves through the words that I say, the actions that I do, the attitudes that I have. And I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm asking you to join me in stepping up and being people of reconciliation, people of peace, people of love. Here's a song that uh, a number of you will recognize. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace. I'm asking you to join me in allowing God to use you as his instrument of peace. I'm asking you, as Paul called us through Scripture, to pray for leaders that we can live quiet and peaceable lives. I'm asking that, that we be light right now. This is a kingdom moment. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our hearts are broken when we see mistreatment of people. And when that would happen because of the color of their skin, breaks our heart even more. 
we know that all men are created in your image and that you love all people. And we recognize that the church is a collection of people and the color of skin and culture and background and language makes no difference. Your word says we are one in Christ. And so, Lord, in some ways we're overwhelmed. We know we need to be doing. We don't know exactly what to do. Would you take us, our church family, and would you use our words and our actions and our attitudes to be instruments of peace? And would you give us a boldness to stand up and speak up when things that are clearly not your will are said and done. And God, we pray for peace. We pray for unity. We pray for reconciliation. And we ask you to use your people, to use us to bring that about. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. I hope you have a great week. Be God's instrument of peace.